as everyone's kind of piling in here. Uh, I want to welcome everyone and thank you for attending the uh, Health Equity Book Club. It is September 30th. I who would have thought that this day would ever come, but here we are. And I'm so glad that you're all here with us. Uh, we've got a great panel today uh, of professionals and community members that uh, really have a lot of in interesting things to say about the book selection this month. Uh, so the Q&A box will be available. Uh, so any questions you have for our panelists, feel free to, to stick them in that Q&A box that's there, and then we'll filter them through. After our panelists do a rotation where everyone's going to give a few minutes uh, of their thoughts on the book, then that's when we'll have an open discussion and open it for, for questions from the audience. Uh, if you have like technical problems or you have something for for me sort of as the, the, the controller of the event, please let me know. Uh, Dr. Simon's gonna moderate the discussion, but I'll be in the background. So if you have anything, feel free to send me a message. My name's Danny. Uh, I'm the program coordinator for the Office of Cancer Research Training and Education at Carmanos Cancer Institute. And um, I also wanna highlight before we get started, uh, not only do we have a great discussion tonight, but mark your calendars, because on December 16th, we are going to have Dr. Damon Tweedy uh, join us, and he is the author of the book A Black Man in a White Coat, which is also our December selection. So mark your calendars, December 16th, we're going to have the author of the book join us, um, and we're very, very excited about that. And um, anyone who's on this call today will get the link to register. I will send it out uh, after this, after this uh, discussion tonight. So I'm very excited. Let me stop talking and let me introduce Dr. Simon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. And, and of course, maybe I could be, the first thing I say is that, um, of course, the uh, success of this event is due to the hard work of Danny Inman. So I really, really appreciate his work, as I appreciate Michelle Cote and her, um, you know, associate position at the Cancer Center for taking this book club and finding it a home. So this is our one year anniversary, happy birthday to us. And, um, you know, I, of course, we all know that reading is so important. I think reading maybe outside, somewhat outside of our profession, we had such a wonderful grand rounds talk about pick 3 ca and colorectal cancer this morning, but it's important for those medical students and fellows and, and um, everyone to be reading other books about why some people get colorectal cancer more than others, and more importantly, why there's disparities in care. That's an equal part of it. And, and you know, and I, I, I face our trainees and they have so much to read and to learn. Um, and I feel that this is such an important component of it that we, as professionals and, you know, non-professionals, whoever we are, we stay well-rounded and we, we have communication. So hopefully the purpose of this is to make a difference in, in, in how we, perform as human beings, as health professionals, or whatever, whatever we do. So I'm going to do a, a brief introduction to the book. Again, everybody is welcome. It's like you're all in my living room, or my Zoom room, or, my, um, or in the Cancer Center Grand Rounds Arena, only it's better because there's so many of you and we're all comfortable where we are. Okay, so the book is called The Health Gap by Sir Michael Marmot. Um, Dr. Marmont is a professor of epidemiology and public health at University College London. Um, in 2000, he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II for services in epidemiology and understanding of health inequalities. Among his many positions, he served as president of the World Medical Association and is currently chair of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, kind of a mouthful. I'll define that in a second, set up by the World Health Organization. So the title of the book in some way reminds me of one of my dad's favorite expressions. There is or there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. I'll see if I can make that correlation. Um, this expression te technically describes the cost of decision-making and consumption. It conveys the idea that things appearing free always have some cost paid by somebody or then nothing in life is truly free. So I don't like the expression low hanging fruit because you have to pick it still. Um, we consider that access to good health care is a basic human right, so I believe that every human being should have access to the benefits of 21st century medicine. 
Dr. Marmot, however, points out in his book that if you're born into a disadvantaged situation, your access to care is different. Perhaps you don't get that free lunch that the rest of us might get. Maybe in terms of free lunch, we should also be thinking about other societal costs for those that do not get optimal care. The costs of treatment of more advanced disease for those that don't have access to screening, lost productivity for people that lose their lives or lose, lose work time, and of course, loss of life. So one more general introductory comment. I'd like to bring up the article, Socially Accountable Academic Health Centers Pursuing a Quadripartite Mission. Um, this is written by Wayne State faculty, um, Dr. Herb Smitherman, Richard Baker, and M. Roy Wilson, who is the president of Wayne State University. And I think that article sets the stage for discussion on the topic. They point out that the major determinants of US health status and perhaps worldwide health status is that almost two thirds is related to social and environmental determinants. They break it down as 50% social, socioeconomic, employment, racism, food, and behavioral, our choices, food choices, choice to exercise, choice on substance abuse, 10% um, environmental led in Michigan polluted living conditions, and the rest 15% genetic and 25% medical care. So the most important determinant of our health is social and behavioral. In his book, Dr. Marmot provides many data points to back up this assertion. He recalls observing as a student, a patient presenting in outpatient psychiatry he remembered and recalled the patient looked the picture of misery as she walked in for follow-up for her history of depression. She cited spousal abuse, beating, um, son in prison, and teenage daughter pregnant. The attending physician's advice for the woman was to switch from the blue pill to the red pill. Afterwards, young Marmot cried out, is that all you can do? And the attending said, there's very little else I could do. HealthCap includes many useful data-driven examples backing up the important relationship between social determinants and outcomes. And these nice examples and graphs are all in chapter two, which is called the organization of misery, a nice title to go to sleep to. So the first graph is a graph of data from the Office of National Statistics in England from 1999 to 2003. And it shows a correlation between improved overall and disability-free survival. So overall, do you survive at all? And then somewhat, are you surviving at least without a disability um, and where you live? Um, and they, they, they straight out the neighborhoods by um, least deprived to most deprived. So of course the worst overall and disability free survival is for individuals from those most deprived neighborhoods. A second graph, um, here they're looking at under age five mortality rates per thousand live births by wealth quintile. So quintile, five groups of wealth from the lowest to the highest. And they graph this for five countries from um, Africa, Asia, and South America. And it's expected each country, the mortality rates are highest for individuals in the lowest quintile of wealth. On closer examination of the graph, you can see that for individuals in the highest quintile in certain countries, such as Uganda and Turkmenistan, that they don't do as well as people in the lowest quintile for countries like Peru. So you can't just target your interventions to people with in the lowest groupings of wealth, but you have to look at the country and the overall social circumstances of the country. Um, the last graph has to do with um, wealth and health in the year 2012. So this is data looking at 23 countries. The United States is one of the countries. On the y-axis is life expectancy at birth in years, of course. And on the x-axis is income um, per person, expected income per person for that country. And, and they indicate in the graph that um, in a poor country, you could buy more for a dollar. Um, they adjust 
the national incomes for purchasing power in their country. Not surprisingly, as income goes up, life expectancy goes up. So one would say, yes, of course, the wealthier countries have higher life expectancy. Um, that's unfortunate, but that's what happens. Marmot also asks an interesting question, well, does money really matter? One would expect that the wealthiest country in the world being the United States and the country that spends the most on healthcare would have the best life expectancy, but that's not actually true. There are approximately 12 other countries that have lower income than the United States that actually have higher life expectancy. So some of these countries from highest income to lowest income, Sweden um, has um, you know, lower income than the US, but higher income relative to the others. Sweden, Greece, Costa Rica, Cuba, they all have lower income than the US, um, but at least the same or even better life expectancy. Um, so what is it about our system that results in less than optimal healthcare outcomes? Um, Dr. Marmot cites that in inner city Baltimore, a man's life expectancy is 63 years old, but not so far away outside the city, the life expectancy is 83 years. Is this a 20 year preventable difference? Can we make a difference with that? It seems like we can make more of a difference there than I could, can based on my choice of chemotherapy. And Sierra Leone, one in 21 young girls, 15 year old young women, died due to childbirth related causes. That's Sierra Leone in Africa. In Italy, it is one in 17,000. So you would think that in the US, we spend so much money, it would be better, but in the US, it's only one in 1,800. So why does the US do relatively poorly while spending more on healthcare than any other country in the world? Marmot points out that poverty alone doesn't drive ill health, but inequality does. And I'm sure my panelists will be speaking to this. Um, statistics show that many diseases, suicide, heart disease, lung disease, obesity, and diabetes are all linked to social disadvantage. In every country, people at relative social advantage suffer health disadvantage and shorter lives. Within countries, the higher the social status of the individual, the better the health. This book forces me to consider my own experience as a physician working in Detroit. How many times have I faced a new breast cancer patient with locally advanced or metastatic disease who also tells me about other challenges in their life from violent death of family members to lack of insurance, poor housing, or even no housing. I asked myself, would a change in social status more, make more of a difference in my treatments? A simple takeaway from the book is that conventional approaches to improving health have emphasized access to technologic solutions and changes in the behavior of individuals, but these methods only go so far. So of course, I'm not dissing all the expensive equipment that we have at Carmanos, but what else can we be doing? The book emphasizes that the rate of illness of a society as a whole determines how well it functions. The greater the health inequality, the greater the dysfunction. So with that introduction, um, hopefully the panelists could explain the rest of the book to me. I'm going to introduce our first panelist, who is um, Angela Trepanier. So it is my pleasure to start off today's panel by introducing my good friend and colleague, Angela Trepanier. Angela is a certified genetic counselor, and you should talk to her more about the profession after the um, session. She's a professor in the Center for Molecular Medicine and Genetics at Wayne State University School of Medicine. Foremost among her many activities on campus, she is director of the Genetic Counseling Training Program. Long ago, I had the pleasure of interacting with Angela in the care of patients in her cancer genetics clinic. I know that Angela provides a wonderful role model of empathetic and equitable care for the next generation of genetic counselors. Her research interests include improving access to and evaluating outcomes of genetic counseling and interests which she shares with her society, the National Society of Genetic Counseling. Angela, you have the stage. Yeah. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I wanted to bring out just a couple of things that really resonated with me about this book. I think Dr. Simon did a great job giving you an introduction to what the book covers. Um, one of the things, and this came from the chapter on education and empowerment, 
Um, they talked about um, a European deprivation scale. What does it mean to have deprivation? And they talked about what people really need um, is to, to be able to pay rent or utility bills, to keep their homes adequately, adequately warm, to be able to face unexpected expenses, uh, to be able to eat meat, fish, or protein equivalent every second day, to be able to take a week's holiday away from home, to have a car, to have a washing machine, to have a color TV, and to have a telephone. And this is a, a European index. Um, in other countries, you know, really the need is to have fresh water and um, a safe place to live. But just thinking about this list and thinking about the fact that there is a significant proportion of the population that doesn't have access to these things that don't seem like an, an I mean, maybe we don't all need a TV, probably I'll need a telephone for communication. And this book really talks about the importance of social interaction, but really is it is it really too much to ask to make sure that people can have adequate nutrition, that they can have a roof, and they can, that they cannot have to worry um, about paying their bills, that they actually get some time off from their jobs? And so I think it's important when thinking about how these social, how these factors affect health, um, how these factors are important um, just to have basic rights and to really kind of think about you know, what policy should we be supporting as educators, as citizens of our country, as people to make sure that people have access to just these really basic needs so that they have the power. This book talks a lot about how important it is to be empowered and feel like you have some control and freedom to live just a basic life. You know, we're not asking to live a highfalutin, you know, filled with money and riches and new clothes kind of life. We're just asking for basic things to be able to survive and to live a happy life. And so I think that if you take into consideration, there are so many people that don't have these things. One of our obligations as a society is to make sure that people have access to these things. And I know um, there are differences in opinion in terms of, you know, what should the government provide? What should people be providing themselves? Um, but when you read the book, you recognize that it's easy to say, you should do that for yourself. I do that for myself. You should do that for yourself. But there are so many barriers that are in the way of people being able to provide for these basic things. And those barriers have a toll. Not only is it a toll on their ability to eat healthy meals, to have a roof over their heads, to not have to worry about paying their electric bills, but it's a toll on their health. It's a toll on their mental health. It can lead to things like um, alcohol use or abuse. It can lead to things like drug abuse. And um, we have to really think about how we can best support people in our community above and beyond what we think that they should be able to do. Because until you understand that some of the power to be able to do those things is not in their hands, then um, you're not able to be part of, we're not able to be part of the solution. So that really resonated with me because I felt like that was a pretty simple list and that those are basic things that people should have access to, especially if they're working um, on, or, you know, they're working and they're trying to work towards having those things. Um, the, and then I'm just going to skip to something else that really resonated with me. And this comes from the chapter, um, Building Resilient Communities. Um, this is a really nice chapter about how it is that we can build that resilience, that social structure that really supports people in getting the things, the basic things that they need and living, um, living satisfied lives, for lack of a better term. And this came from um, an Aboriginal activist group, and they said, if you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you, um, if it, if I can't put my glasses on, if you come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And what that quote says um, in the context of this chapter is that if we help people, um, all you know, but if we help each other, it's not just helping the individuals that need help; it actually helps all of society. And so, you know, sometimes people think of this as charity, but it's not charity. It's actually making all of us better, all of our societies better. Um, reaching out, recognizing when some people have less than others and fixing those, 
uh, disparities that lead to that, that can make a difference for all of us. And when that makes a difference from, for all of us, it, it elevates all of us. Um, so just you know, thinking about it from that perspective is really important, um, especially in political debates when, uh, you know, again, people don't wanna give things to people who aren't doing their fair share, but thinking about, you know, are there barriers to people even achieving the basic things? And if there are, how can we help? Because if we help, it helps everybody. Um, and then just one other thing, and this came from the end of the book, it was kind of a call to action for um, us as healthcare providers. And they talked about five things um, that we could do um, that would actually be helpful in addressing social determinants of health and health disparities. Um, and they said one of the most important things out of this list is education and training. So training healthcare providers to recognize those social determinants of health and to see patients in the context of those. Again, not making judgments, but recognizing where patients come from and meeting them where they are. Um, so that's so education and training for the trainees um, that they should recognize those things and then helping them see those patients in context is the second thing. Um, they also said that as an employer, provide good working conditions. Um, that's another message that was integrated throughout the book is that it's one thing to have a job, but it's another thing to have a job where you feel some satisfaction that what you're doing is actually making a difference and that you're getting some benefit at being at that job. Um, in one of the chapters of the book, they talked about an individual that worked at a big warehouse um, and he was a picker. Um, and that's one of the people that actually um, picks the, the um, objects that somebody orders off the shelves and then delivers them to somebody else who packs them, who then delivers those to somebody else who actually mails it out. And the pickers have quotas. They have a certain amount they're supposed to pick in a certain amount of time. Um, they are really unreasonable quotas, ones they can never meet. And so at the end of every day, they're feeling like they didn't meet their quota. Um, the job conditions are really unsafe. The amount of weight they're supposed to carry to meet those quotas is really not reasonable for um, you know, the, the individual. And, and because they are so driven to um, do such a high quantity of work, they don't get to interact with anybody in their job. So they're there for eight or nine hours. They have two 15 minute breaks and a 30 minute lunch and really no time to interact, no positive feedback. Um, the quotas are set so they can never meet them. It's a really unappealing job. They're always at risk of being fired for not meeting those quotas. And then at the end of the day, they're still staying there because they don't have any other career option. So I think you know that message that as, if you're an employer, if you're somebody who has that power, make sure that you're providing good working conditions for your employees because that actually contribute, contributed to that individual's health, not just physically, but also mentally. And then work with others was another um, point that they made. It's really important to work with like-minded people to make the um, circumstances better. And then finally, to advocate. Advocate for policies that make a difference for all people, um, whether that's clean water in Flint, whether that, I just saw that the governor put on her um, budget for this year that um, it's um, helping pay for child care for families. Um, whether it's making sure that we have better access to healthcare, whatever it is, um, advocating to make sure, again, that we're elevating everybody will make all of society a better place. And so I think this book um, just really points out the disparities that exist, the effect that those disparities have on health, the dramatic differences in um, disability-free life, and in lifespan in individuals simply based on health disparities and social determinants of health. And these are factors that we have the power to change. We just have to want to change them. Great, thank you. Thank you. And um, you know, again, as a reminder to the audience, please jot down your questions in the chat and um, we will have a chance to speak to each of the panel members. So, it is also my pleasure to introduce our next panel member, um, Bill Winkler. Um, Bill is serving in the role as patient advocate, which I feel is one of the most important roles on our panels, as well as today, helping to keep health professionals, especially maybe doctors, especially focus on critical issues. From a review of Bill's bio, it appears that Bill has been very busy over the past, I believe 50 or more years, um, here's a quick snapshot. Um, he formerly owned a, a full-service clinical laboratory that was a nationwide reference lab for veterinarians. 
For 20 years, he owned two full service family style restaurants. And for the past 40 years, he owned and still operates a consulting business working with nonprofits, scientists, and small businesses. In this period of time, he successfully raised millions of dollars for research at the School of Medicine and at other colleges and on main campus. So Bill, please um, give us your thoughts. Um, I found this book to be extremely enlightening. Um, I, one of the things that was, that really struck me was, um, and I'm not sure which chapter it was in, but it was talking about the firemen in, and I'm not sure where they were, okay, who took it upon themselves to start to reach out into the community to try to change a lot of things that were going on in the community that were um, contrary to the health of the community. And they started to talk to folks that smoked and they tried to convince them to not smoke, or they were talking about uh, smoke detectors to make sure there were smoke detectors in the house. So they approached it from, uh, I'm a fireman and I wanna look at every possible uh, cause of uh, why I have to be called to a particular uh, location. And then they changed their perspective and they became social workers. And I found that line to be really interesting because all of a sudden they realized that this is more than just uh, preventing forest fires or preventing fires within the confines of your home. This is about basic um, human understanding of how to live a better life, a fuller life. There were so many things in this book, so many verticals in this book that, that were important for folks to understand uh, that one of, the, one of the fundamental issues here, um, I've been involved in teaching Head Start programs for 30 years. And I know that early childhood education is foundational and, and it changes your life for the rest of your life because it gives you a foundation to thrive on. And the, in the course of the book, every vertical that he examined, whether it was poverty, whether it was education, whether it was empowerment, all of these things, um, he backed up with really, really significant research. And it wasn't so much that he was proving the point. I believe that lots of folks out there believe what's in this book, but it, this is the first time it's been clearly articulated as far as I'm concerned. Um, I've always struggled with the concept of what's fair and who decides what's fair. It's always been a very difficult thing for me because you always hear, well, that's not fair. Well, you know, uh, describe to me what fair is because that's a personal understanding. That's a personal perception. And it causes a lot of consternation for a lot of people. Um, you know, it's really interesting because I've spent probably three or four days writing notes in every one of these chapters. I'm sure Angela, you did the same thing, you know? And so when I walked out of my office today, I left all those notes there. <laughs> so when I got home, I said, I'm looking for those notes. <laughs> I could not find the notes. But anyways, um, I, I, I really don't know how to, how, to, how to stress the importance of physicians. I, I actually worked with Dr. Hamill. Uh, we did a, about a year-long research thing on how doctors in clinics speak to their patients, how effective they are in addressing their patients. And we came up with some very interesting insights, and we had the good fortune of being able to listen to audio and look at video in terms of how doctors relate to their patients. And I know that every one of us has had the, op has had the opportunity of speaking to uh, somebody a physician who was very technically illiterate, but had um, some very poor communication skills. Many of the doctors that we saw when we reviewed the videos really um, had no intimate contact with their, 
with their patients. They just, they miss that part, you know, they read off their clipboard. And, um, and I think that in medicine, especially physicians have to start to take a look at themselves as something other than uh, that very narrow uh, entity that looks at the diagnostic tools that they have and then suggests what the remedies are. They need to, as the book states so eloquently, so many different ways, they need to go back further into that person's life and understand what are the conditions that have led this person to this particular point in their life where they show up in my office with a problem that could have been addressed uh, many, many years ago in most instances. The issues of poverty, the issues of, uh, of families, destructive families, all of that stuff, especially he emphasized in, in much of what he talked about is the toll that it takes on <laughs> And he's, the way he addresses it, I, I absolutely thought that he was right on target because I think my own personal perspective is that women take the front end of most of the stuff that goes on. And uh, he did a really great job of articulating how, you know, all we have to do is make sure that every woman, and it's just not in our society. He's talking about this thing from a global perspective. We, you know, we have to be, I believe that, you know, the book was written from a global perspective. It's just not here in this country. It's all over. Yob knows that, okay? Right from where your parents came from. It's, it's a global issue. The question becomes, can we affect a change? And how do we go about affecting that change? Starts with education, I would imagine. That's where it starts. But you have to accept the education is valid. You have to accept the credibility of the people that deliver that education. And so I believe in, in this particular politicized environment that our, we find ourselves in here, that there's a lot of disbelief and uh, a lot of judgment in terms of um, truth and the circumstances that surround truth. Um, I would. I would say that um, if anybody has an opportunity to read this book, I would encourage them to do that. There's so many things that, that are embedded in the material that will make you look at yourself and hopefully will make you an advocate for the change that needs to take place in our culture and globally. And that's all I have to say right now. I can't remember hey, all thank my notes. you. Thank you. I, I must, uh, you know, we're such a natural group. We're so close to on time. We're a, uh, we have a couple extra minutes. Um, so let's keep going. So, our next panelist, um, you know, I would like to, well, for our next panelist, I would like to welcome Dr. Patricia Wren. Um, Dr. Wren is chair and professor of public health at Wayne State University. Um, so, she's chair of the Department of Public Health on the undergraduate level. And many of us don't even realize that that exists. So we're so happy to have her. Um, she has extensive training, including a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's degree in public service management from DePaul in Chicago. She also completed a master's in health behavior, health education, and a PhD in education from the University of Michigan. Dr. Wren started her public health career as part of a research team evaluating HIV AIDS prevention and service organizations funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Since then, her research has focused on the measurement of patient-centered outcomes, including satisfaction, mobility, and functional status, all issues, of course, important to us. Her work has included both community-based research and clinical trials focusing on HIV, glaucoma and strabismus, breast and colorectal cancer, stroke, inflammatory bowel disease, mental health, and suicide, as well as pelvic floor disorders in women. So really, her work encompasses everything that we do. So Dr. Ren, the floor is yours. And you're, there, there you go. Thank you, Dr. Simon. Um, greetings, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And this book is like food, I think, to us in uh, the public health field. Uh, it, it sort of feeds our soul uh, in lots of ways and uh, it vexes us in other ways. And 
I, I would say that my approach to this book, um, maybe unlike uh, my colleagues who spoke before me, I sort of have a love-hate relationship um, with, with this book. And, uh, and so I'll tell you a little about uh, the love side and, and then I'll tell you some of the struggles uh, that I have. Um, on the positive side, uh, this is exactly who we are and what we do in the undergraduate department of public health here at Wayne State. Uh, we are focused on those causes of the causes. Uh, uh, back in the days of, of sort of business planning and lean processing, there was a movement uh, to ask five why questions to get to the real heart of an issue. Um, the automotive industry was trying to figure out why their gas mileage wasn't better. And so push by asking the question why five times to try to get to the heart. And I think in public health that can help us. Um, a lot of my students, for example, say things like obesity is the greatest public health threat that we have. And, and so we get to tease out, but why are people obese? And why do they eat those foods? And why are those foods the cheaper foods? And why does our government subsidize those things and not others? And we can't make healthy choices if we don't have healthy options available. So I like uh, that Michael Marmot really does center his argument uh, around those social determinants of health and, and really affords us the opportunity, rich with data, uh, to look at the systematic inequalities that play out to affect the context of those choices and the context uh, in which people live. And, and it allows us to really think about unequal health, as, um, as Bill mentioned, as being unjust. And so then what, what do we do with that unjustness and, and who measures it and how do we measure it? I will simply say for folks who really did like this book, so still on the love side of things, uh, there's a, an old school documentary that includes uh, Michael Marmot among others, and it aired originally on PBS. So you might have seen it if you were watching your local PBS channel. And the seven part series was called Unnatural Causes. And it includes a star studded cast of public health professionals. So if you could imagine George Clooney and Viola Davis and Francis McDormand and Idris Elba, as Michael Marmot and Ichiro Kawachi and Ana Diaz Rue and Leonard Syme, all epidemiologists, uh, you kind of get the sense of this star-studded cast. And, um, but it brings to life uh, the Whitehall study that featured so prominently and, and uh, Dr. Marmot's work to expose uh, the kind of income health race inequality. Um, but uh, I, I will, for those of you who want more, but also like to see uh, work come alive, um, I would commend that documentary to you. But I said I sort of have a hate relationship with this as well. Uh, and here's what I would say about this. I think that Dr. Marmot uh, tried to walk a very fine line in raising some uh, of these vexing issues for us around access and inequality and the intersections of race and place and class and sex. But he stopped short, I think, uh, uh, sort of uh, chickened out uh, in giving us a real path to fixing it. Uh, he said repeatedly that he was not a politician but wanted his work uh, to inform politics. But I think I struggled um, and I looked um, both at my notes and I looked at the index. Um, it doesn't reference racism and it doesn't reference sexism and it doesn't speak openly about uh, discrimination in using that language. Uh, and I think if we can't speak those words out loud, uh, then we are ill-equipped to do the hard work uh, to rally the support, Angela's example of the community-based work that it would take to rally the support that we would need to make any kind of meaningful systemic change. And it wasn't until April of this year, it's stunning, it's hard to believe, but it wasn't until April of this year that the Centers for Disease Control declared racism a serious threat to public health. I have colleagues for, who did the Detroit area study many, many years ago, uh, David Williams and James Jackson, among others from the University of Michigan, who invented a measure that was essentially a measure of everyday discrimination. Things like 
people treat me with less courtesy. People treat me with less respect. People look at me like I'm not smart. People look at me like they're afraid of me. Um, people call me names or harass me or I'm threatened. I'm an overeducated white woman. I don't answer yes to those questions. It's my privilege and my opportunity that allows me to navigate my life and my health and my choices. And I think that Dr. Marmot let us down a little bit in sort of not taking on uh, with the force of, of his platform, uh, the things that we might do to remedy these things. It's not enough in public health to measure the gap. It's not enough in public health to know that this many potential years of life have been lost. The central question now for us is what are we willing to do to close the gap? So I'll be excited uh, to hear uh, from our participants, folks who are online with us today, uh, to hear what we might do together. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so one final panelist. Um, so of course we say last but not least, I would like to introduce Yuab Tadesi. When EUAB was highly recommended by one of our past panelists, that is Taylor Barrow, president of the Black Student Association at the School of Medicine, I knew that we were in for a great addition to the team. EUAB is a second year medical student at Wayne State University. He's taking a year off working on research in our department. The story begins with his parents who escaped war-torn Ethiopia to seek political asylum in the United States. They were freedom fighters, beholden to uplifting their people from an oppressive military regime. How many of us can really say something like that? That really is incredible. He has carried their fighting spirit and strong love of community in his journey through his work in peer health education, health behavior changes within California's and now Detroit's underserved communities. UAB was recently recognized as a difference maker by the Office of Undergrad Medical Education. I don't think we've had any panel members that are difference makers, so I'm very excited about that as well. We look forward to this discussion delving into the complexities of health equity. Yuab, please take over. Thank you, Dr. Simon. Yes. I mean, I don't, I don't know if you can tell right now, but I am blushing intensely. So thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. Um, I was very moved by this book for a lot of the reasons why Dr. Ren said she loved this book. And at the same time, like Dr. Ren, I also share my concern that there was not more mentioned in terms of action uh, regarding what we can do as everyday citizens, let alone as academics and professionals. Um, and, you know, it's funny, this, this book really enticed me to dual activity of my own and go through the statistics that can necessarily affect me. And I want to share that with you all today. So I was raised in Alameda County, California, in the East Bay area. And one shocking statistic is that in the city of Hayward, where about 100,000 people reside in Alameda County, in that little area, 15 to 19 year olds, males, for example, here, um, die by gun violence. 48.6 48 individuals of that population per 100,000 die. And thankfully, I have not become a part of that statistic. Unfortunately, there was one in 2010, a classmate of mine, Samuel Nava, who unfortunately contributed that, to that statistic. Additionally, when I went to Santa Clara University for my undergraduate institution and education, mental health was a very big thing that was mentioned in our school and in my work in peer health education. It's something that our program always touted as paramount to the overall health of our college students. In that area, 13.8 people per 100,000 between the ages of 17 to 21 died of suicide. Thankfully, I'm very blessed to say that I have not become part of that statistic. However, another classmate of mine, Jason Bassett, contributed to that statistic, unfortunately, when he took his life in 2015. As I continued to my education, heading towards Los Angeles County for my master's degree in applied life sciences, I was very unfortunate to say that I ended up in a car accident, but thankfully, as you all can see, hopefully I am okay. Um, I looked into these different statistics regarding car crashes in California specifically, and they said that one out of 106 die of car crashes, just individuals per 
um, in, in the state of California died by car crash. And again, thankfully, I'm happy to say that I have not contributed to that statistic. Unfortunately, another pre-med uh, classmate of mine from Santa Clara around the year of 2017, 2018, uh, Onye Okolo died in Sacramento in that year from a car crash due to a drunk driver. As far as I say, I made it all to this point. Now a medical student, I am, I would say about 3% of black men populate the entire medical student population. And I say all that to say this, it should be difficult to reach this part of the game, so to speak. Medical school is not an easy thing to achieve, but it should not be impossible, especially for someone who looks like me, let alone the fact that black males now at this point in my life have a cumulative percentage, 15% chance of being incarcerated at the age of 25. I'm 26 now. So this is what I believe Sir Michael Marmot was mentioning when he said there is a social gradient to health inequality. And in the earlier conversation that we had before this panel started, um, Dr. Ren mentioned something that's very astute, I will say, and I'm gonna take your words here, Dr. Ren, um, when mentioning how all the different departments can kind of work with public health and how that can kind of impact Wayne State as a community, you use the words, all roads lead to Rome. And I also believe the same, traffic safety, gun violence, Mental health, all those things lead to public health. And the question is, where does that road lead? Well, Sir Michael Marmot mentions that in focusing on public health, we see a better life expectancy. But at the same time, we also have to ask ourselves, who exactly are the people that are suffering from lower life expectancies around the country, and let alone here in Detroit as well? I am a patient recruiter right now for Dr. Hamill who also worked with Mr. Winkler over there. Appreciate you for collaborating with us so far in previous studies. And one patient yesterday mentioned that to mention to me that they trust their doctor wholeheartedly because they know what they're talking about. And while I, of course, admire the fact that physicians do have a certain level of authority when it comes to medical matters, I also think that as a country, we have a very significant problem with health literacy, how to process of health information, where we get it from. Too often have we seen friends, family, refer to social media, refer to untrusted websites or Wikipedias and the sort in terms of giving their health information. And worse yet, there are some who simply just don't care because of the fact that they have too many things to worry about in front of them to worry about their overall health in a long-term sense. And so I wanted to conclude my comments here in mentioning that the things that we can do just to kind of shore up Sir Michael Marmot's argument, and I'll do the best I can here in terms of what we can do. As academics, we can continue to try to focus on how exactly the public will perceive the information that we distribute and how we can communicate that in a sense that not only academics can understand, but the everyday citizen can understand. So often do we see journals have very, very extravagant language that a lot of us can't seem to understand. If I was to show it to my niece or my my auntie who don't are not familiar at all with academia, they cannot process a single word of it, and that should not be the case. Additionally, as medical students, a, a population that I belong to, we have to do more to understand and appreciate the social determinants of health. Thankfully, we have a course that talks about that in Wayne State, and I think more can be done to continue to get students to understand how, as physicians, they can help to understand and more importantly alleviate the social deterrence towards a higher life expectancy amongst Detroit's population, patient population. And as everyday citizens, I think we, again, I know this is a, uh, a contrite argument and one that's mentioned so often, but I'll use it anyways. We lack as everyday citizens on average, I would say, the attention towards local politics, the people who end up becoming your city councilors, the people who end up becoming your mayor, the people who end up chairing the health and human services department of your city. I think is incredibly important to know their, their names, their positions, what they believe in. And I think it's less important to understand, not understand per se, but I'll use the word um, obsess over the latest gossip uh, at the US Capitol. And I would say that I think we're, we should be more focused on local politics. And at the end of the day, that put, puts so much more emphasis on our health as a community. And I think that's something we can collectively focus on as everyday citizens. With that, I just want to thank you all for your time and I'm looking forward to answering any questions that you all may have. Thank you again for having me. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate that we're um, on time and we have 
35 or so minutes to ask questions. So I'm expecting the uh, chat box to fill up momentarily, questions or comments or reactions. Um, you know, I kind of, I, I um, came in a little later today after Grand Rounds and I had the privilege of listening to Detroit today. So I sort of imagine myself as Steve Henderson taking all these wonderful comments from the community. Um, but until that chat box fills in, I'm going to um, maybe address a question. Um, start with uh, Patricia Wren. Um, you probably alluded to this in your comments, but what, what would you what would you have liked to see um, Michael Marmot include in this book? I think you alluded to it. But what are some like some concrete things? Yeah, I think um, you know. Uh, Iwab uh, extended my my comments in a really lovely way at the end, where uh, really all of this is on the ballot. Um, you know, I I have a really great job. I get to train young people, uh, undergraduate college students, uh, to be engaged in in public health, and and our field is a social justice field. Our field is is an equity field. Uh, and so we have to jump on those uh, bandwagons and soapboxes with both feet uh, and a megaphone if we've got one handy. So the census matters, you know, and making sure that communities are counted and that every individual is counted. Um, we will struggle, I think, in Detroit um, if we are significantly and and disproportionately undercounted certain people. We we just we know. Um, Every missed person um, results in, in about $1,800 a person per year not coming back to our region. So if you think about a census being every 10 years, that's $18,000 per person who we miss. We often miss people who are under the age of five. We miss new immigrants and new refugees. We miss communities of color. Uh, we miss LGBTQ persons, um, Medicaid, Medicare, roads, Head Start, I, we heard about Head Start today, um, school nutrition and, and SNAP benefits. Those are all census uh, tied to the census for their funding. So what can we do? We got to count in all of our things. We've got to count in a census when it comes back around. We have to count at the ballot box because all of this is on the ballot. Outdoor air quality is on the ballot and health access is on the ballot and housing is on the ballot and how we fund schools uh, equitably is on the ballot. So yeah, I, I will I will simply give voice uh, to you, Iwab, about sort of saying saying that additionally about what we can do. And we know pound for pound that it matters. Um, medical advances um, save lives. There's no question. Um, but reducing inequalities when we've done the math on the uh, when we can do uh, race and age adjustments in, in mortality data. Um, we know that leveling the playing field and closing that gap statistically would save five times more lives than the medical advancements themselves did. So uh, yes, I think that there's plenty that we might do uh, if we have the will to do it. Um, can I um, interject here for just a second? Absolutely. Um, first of all, Dr. Wren, I thought your comments on racism were absolutely right on because um, I really didn't see an emphasis in the book on that. You just got a cursory kind of look at that. <clears throat> I think it's a fundamental issue, not only here in this country, but globally. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other part of this is that, you know, he talked about a new kind of economy. He talked, uh, basically kind of alluded to like a social democratic kind of economy structure, which I, I am particularly interested in because I think it's something that could work. But one of the things that was not addressed throughout the entire book was the fact that there is an issue out here from a technical perspective that is not being addressed as it should be, I, in my belief, right? And I've been looking at this for a long time, probably 15 to 18 years. And that is the very dramatic effect that artificial intelligence is having on the entire spectrum of what work is all about so that we can educate people. We can get better at educating, maybe, you know, and we can educate everybody, maybe. But the bottom line is that if we don't 
do something about this about what is going to happen and it is happening right now with the inroads that artificial intelligence is making and i mean uh, dr simon knows artificial intelligence is making an inroad into medicine you know it's making inroads into law and so that has to be part of this discussion because eventually what's going to happen is that levels of work are going to start to disappear because they're not going to be done by humans. They're going to be done by, by artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence is not going to continue to make more work and employ more people because the basic premise of artificial intelligence is to get rid of those workers because coming out of business, the highest cost you have is employees. And so if you're a, if you're an if you're a capitalist and you're an entrepreneur and you don't want to spend a whole lot of money on a regular basis for roll up costs etc cetera, etc cetera, you get artificial intelligence and then you increase shareholder value and that's an issue that's a very very difficult issue to address but it's there thank you thank you there is a question actually it disappeared but the question was out there from my uh, uh, good friend, Elizabeth Heath, asking Dr. Wren, um, I believe the question is, are you wanting to see more public policy than public health? Or maybe something like, is public policy the, the bottom line issue? Uh, you know, public health would include public policy. It's probably no accident that I have an undergraduate degree in political science. Um, because politics and policy are sort of at the heart of, of all of these things. So they're certainly not incompatible, um, but it's also not, it's not, none of the things that we're talking about are random, right? The entire premise of, of Sir Marmot's book was that none of these things are random. These are systematic structural inequalities that are causing good health and long life for certain segments of, of global populations and, and other segments are having worse health, more suffering and shorter lives. It's also not random who becomes a politician. And so certainly in this country, uh, the folks who occupy the very seats where policy is debated, Michigan struggling to get a budget passed, Congress in Washington struggling to not shut down, um, those persons don't look like the vast majority of us. Women still make up less than 20% of all elected officials. Uh, white college educated uh, men over the age of 65 disproportionately make up um, elected officials and really represent about 10% uh, of the US population. So again, we gotta, I think, do some training uh, for persons who want to use public policy, but who could themselves be in the in the political arena and and at the local level is a great place to start. I would agree. Uh, and so, uh, running for mayor, running for city council, running for student government here at Wayne State um, are all excellent opportunities to put public health policy in action. Um, all in all of the spheres in which we live and live, learn, and work. I would say. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking about um, these issues and facing students. Um, Angie, what kind of barriers do you think or do you face or maybe people going into genetic counseling are really so tuned in or, or are you feeling there are barriers the new generation of students are facing? Um, in terms, I mean, there's so I can think of two different types of barriers. First, there's barriers to admission to a genetic counseling program that are related to um, social determinants. Things like, you know, being a first generation student, um, having debt from undergraduate, and then having to think about taking on debt for graduate school, especially in a profession like ours that's not heavily funded in terms of scholarships, or at least here it's not. Um, knowing what genetic counseling is, like we need to have a diverse workforce, but if people haven't had access to genetic counseling services, and we know that underrepresented individuals are less likely to have access to genetic counseling services, they're not going to actually think about that as a career choice, not going to see that as something that's on their radar. So that's a barrier to admission, and that, you know, limits then the profession's ability to be able to 
provide services to diverse individuals in the sense that you know people want to see people that look like them providing their health care whenever possible, especially when you're talking about sensitive issues like genetics. So that's a barrier to you know entry into the into the system. In terms of barriers that students have when they're in, um, are you talking about, about, about barriers related to patients? Are you talking about what kind of barriers? You know, actually, thank you for answering the way you did. What I was really thinking of was barriers that students have in terms of understanding these issues. Are they accepting the fact that social determinants are important? Are they accepting the fact that they need to find out more about their patients than just the disease? I think it, I think it depends. I mean, it just depends. People come in with different experiences, um, different lived experiences themselves. Um, sometimes we'll have students that have had their own health um, concerns, and that's actually what motivated them to be part of this profession because they understood the factors that influenced their ability to get healthcare services. Um, sometimes they really don't have any perspective. They've had great access, um, you know, great education, great access. And then it's really on us to make sure that we set an even playing field when it comes to educating our students so that they do understand. And one of the things we look at when we're trying to recruit students to our program is we are, we are looking for people that have some sense of who Detroit is, who our population is, what are some of the disparities they face, and have that willingness to actually work with that patient population. And not just on paper, knowing that diversity is a buzzword now and that you want to work with diverse patients that really, really understand um, the disparities in this population and they want to help address them through genetic services. But yeah, it's across the board, so it really is on us to make sure that the education we're providing um, make, um, makes everyone aware of these disparities, how they influence services, how they influence follow-up when somebody gets a genetic diagnosis. And for a lot of genetic conditions that are complex diseases, how they influence their risk of actually developing those diseases when they have those genetic risk factors. Um, and then in like, uh, I can't remember who said it, health literacy, that's a huge issue. Um, teaching our students how to be able to teach, talk to people at their level and not above people, really critical in all healthcare professions, um, but also in genetic counseling. And then and genetic counseling has a counseling aspect of it too. So being willing to identify what those contextual factors are and address them as part of the counseling is really important in the effectiveness of the services that we offer. But that's on us as providers to provide that training and then for students to get those experiences um, in their clinical internships. Great. Well, thank you. Okay, so we have a question and, you know, usually I'm sitting here thinking if I'm in a lecture hall, and nobody asks me questions. I usually start asking them questions. It's a little hard to do this. So thank you for uh, the question. Um, this came in, uh, the company I work with, and, and maybe I'll focus this on to start with you uh, and, and then anybody else. The company I work with is attempting to provide better health literacy to disenfranchised communities with tools they can access from your phone. So I was curious, what do you think is the greatest challenge limiting easy and clear communication with communities and individuals that are missed by the system or don't regularly engage with health information? I don't know if you have any thoughts, um, you have, if you want to take a stab at it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, uh, I do. So just referring back to a, a project that I work on um, back when I was doing a master's program, uh, I worked with Pfizer on social media as a tool for clinical trial recruitment amongst minorities. And in that, we really explored health literacy in depth. And one of the biggest barriers, I will speak for uh, the Black community specifically, because I feel like this applies the best, and that is that of cultural trust. As you all may know, especially for those who are well-versed in public health, I mean, the Tuskegee syphilis trials is one of the major barriers as to why African-American citizens today still do not trust clinical trials in general, medicine as a whole, and the healthcare system here in the United States, amongst many an example, both I'm sure personal anecdotes included. I think when it comes to the biggest barriers in terms of uh, communication and having people access healthcare information in a I will say healthy way. Cultural trust is huge. Additionally, using language that is understandable to the population you were talking about. I remember I saw, perhaps I am a bit uh, wrong in the statistics, so I apologize for any misconceptions here, but I believe that I saw a statistic that in Detroit, functional literacy was only about 40 to 50%. 
And that speaks volumes as towards what kind of health information you can portray to the patient population here in Detroit, and more specifically, how you convey that information. So I guess there is no clear answer. There are many answers, and all of them require more nuanced investigation. Um, I would find that especially when it comes to our non-English as first language individuals here in Detroit, I believe that is one in 10, if I'm not mistaken, I'm looking at that statistic recently, uh, looking into how exactly you want to communicate to that population specifically, if it's in a way that respects their cultural background in a way that also, if you have medical interpreters, those who speak in the dialect of different languages that they may speak, for example, Spanish has different dialects, Arabic has different dialects, and we have to respect that and the different cultures that come with those different dialects. So culture resides in a majority of my answer, I will say. And once we begin to be more well-versed and culturally, I would say, knowledgeable of the different cultures around here in Detroit, the better off we will serve our patient population here as well. Um, Patricia, you have a comment. Yes, um, uh, I want to echo everything that um, uh, my colleagues just said and, and offer this in addition. Um, I was struck uh, when you framed the question, um, Michael, that the uh, the questioner commented on developing an app and was interested in health literacy in order to take advantage of this technology. And so as part of our conversation about inequality, we have to talk about the digital divide and particularly in Detroit. We have 40% of Detroiters who don't have access uh, to internet. We still have a significant percentage of Detroiters who don't have smartphones or access to data plans uh, in multi-generational houses where perhaps the youngest member of the household may get a Chromebook or a tablet or something from their school, that's the device that's shared by the entire family. And so when we were all fully remote, it was putting an awful lot of pressure on those families who didn't have as easy access as a family who has multiple iPads and multiple devices. And if worse comes to worse, I can look at it on my phone. And so we certainly wanna tick all of the boxes around cultural competence and humility and sensitivity and language. But at the same time, we also have to do the work to level the playing field around technology and access. And I think that's a key component of our health literacy in terms of where and how people can participate in that information exchange. Great, thanks. And, and actually, this is um, a popular question. And um, I think Danny could facilitate this. Um, one of our um, administrators or, or one of our workers in this area, Noel Larkin, uh, requested uh, the ability to answer this question live. And Danny, I'm wondering if you could you could bring Noel in. I sure can in just a second. Okay, great. And of course, if anybody else has anything to add for their question, um, we could get you. I don't see Noel in my attendance list. Is uh, um, is is he the, perhaps this phone number that's called in? Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> it's in the chat. Sure. Um, so I can, why, we can let you work on that for a minute. Maybe okay. maybe you might want to send him an email and figure out how to connect him in because I think, right. I think his, his uh, perspective will be really important. So, you know, I, I was, you know, of course, so anybody else have questions to ask of each other, please don't just leave it to me. But I, I was thinking um, about EUAB that you're here on this platform. And let's say you're in a room with the Dean of the medical school. Um, and, and he served on our last panel, or I think it was the last panel, um, Dr. Schweitzer, Mark Schweitzer. And, and, and you, this is your wish list for what you want the medical school to give medical students in terms of um, social determinants of health or to make, make you better practicing doctors. What, what would you, and, and maybe that's a tough question. I was actually thinking of a similar question for um, Mr. Winkler, because I know you've had some affiliation with the Cancer Center in terms of patient care. Um, and what would you want the Cancer Center to provide you know, for patients? But I don't know, you have, is that, does that question make sense? 
Yes, of course it does. And it's funny you ask that question because this is something I have been ruminating on for years. <laughs> I've been here since 2020, but I've been like sitting on this very question that you asked, Dr. Simon. Um, this Again, the P4 course is what we, I think, I don't know what the P4 course stands for. I know it stands for professionalism, population, patient, and another P that I'm forgetting. So please forgive me. Um, it is part of our medical curriculum and it, it is a two-year program. The first year is mostly, at least last year's rendition of it, was mostly focused around uh, breakout rooms, Zoom breakout rooms, a lot of Zoom school as we've all been subjected to. Um, regarding a number of different social issues that plague the United States and of course Detroit uh, at large, including things like food insecurity, things like poverty specifically, things like economic disenfranchisement and other similar issues. And the second year uh, up until the moment I decided to take a leave of absence was mostly focused around providing voices of the Detroit community to add face essentially to those issues. And while I'm very grateful for that experience, I do think that um, I'll say my classmates and I find that there could be an alternate approach a much more effective approach in trying to educate our medical students. And I think that definitely culminates into something that's actually not too different from my experience at the Keck Graduate Institute for my master's program. So just to add more clarification to the project that I worked on with Pfizer, it was something called a team master's project. Essentially, what happened was Pfizer would provide a sum of money for the school, and that would be used to fund our students working in a team of different schools. We had uh, master's of business and science. We had master's of genetic counseling. We had um, I was part of the post-baccalaureate pre-medical certificate program. So that was where I fit into the mix. And it was a group of four students. And we were basically tasked with working with corporate liaisons as well as faculty liaisons on this project. So a lot of different parties involved, essentially. And this kind of project culminated in a professional presentation at the headquarters of that corporation of choice. I don't think it would be a bad idea to do some similar rendition of this in terms of nonprofit organizations associated with patient care throughout the city, organization like Mr. Winkler's, for example, in which you have teams of medical students working with nonprofits throughout the course of their preclinical education and working with them to figure out how we can improve patient outcomes in a variety of different ways through a variety of different measures, at which point that we can have the P4 administration, uh, administrative branch decide what those specific educational outcomes would be for the students. But that's, again, just the musings of a medical student. So I'll leave that the rest of the conversation or the uh, answers to Mr. Winkler. And a rather insightful comment, I might add. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, the Patient Family Advisory Council, which I've been a member of for quite a while, specifically has the task of trying to make the experience of patients that come through Carmanos as stressless as possible. That is a real difficult definition to articulate because people are stressed in so many different ways, but we really do work hard at trying to figure out how we can give input to the staff, to the administration, and things that they can do within the context of bringing patients in. And, and while the patients are still in the hospital, what are some of the things that can improve that patient care? That's an extremely hard task, and that's why we wrestle with it and it's you know it's not a it's not a one off thing i mean it's it's a continuous kind of evolutionary thing that that we look at a, a process that we look at to refine and get better the thing i have to say about carmanos is that um, they listen they listen to the suggestions that we make as a matter of fact we try to push a little harder to you know, and set ourselves into maybe a different level of decision making at Carmanos. And we will continue to do that, by the way, because we believe that um, it's necessary for people that have A, experienced cancer, have been caregivers to those that have had cancer, that they have innate knowledge that those that haven't had it are able to. Uh, that we'll be able to, to give some pretty insightful commentary. And we have been over the years, been able to do that. And we'll continue to do that. Um, 
And that's why I'm an advocate for Hermanos because I think they do a, a wonderful job. Uh, so, so that's it. And I, I see Dr. Clameris is on the call. At least I think he was on the call. Ah, uh, yes, and there he is. <laughs> Yes. Thinking yeah. us all. Um, any other responses to that? You know, maybe you know something that I think of a lot that I think is just such a basic thing that we're missing. I've seen so many um, patients with trainees, and then they're presenting the history and all the inf medical information very well. They they learn that very well, and I say, oh, by the way, what does that patient do, or wh wh where are they from, or what do they do, or and and it, and sometimes the, the gaps are so glaring, you know. And and you know we've had people with you know very, you know, did you know that that person, you know, is a top top physician in the field, you know, and, and no idea. So so I think um, you know perhaps just the lesson that we need to talk to everybody and think of them as if they're. You know, treat them like their own, our own family members, family members that we like. Um, um, you know, and an, another sort of maybe question for everybody, um, and and this is kind of a comment. My my son actually was home during COVID when I thought of this idea and was talking about it a lot to whoever would listen to me. Probably talked about it a little too much. I said, yeah, that's great. But what are you gonna, what, what, is, what is it gonna result in? Or maybe a similar question from, um, uh, you know, that Dr. Heath asked all our trainees in their research meeting, well, what's the outcome? You know, what, what, how is that going to change things? So I don't know, maybe some perspectives on how this kind of book club can change things. Should more organizations be doing it? Um, is there something we should be do we should or can be doing differently? Um, maybe from the panelists now that you're participating on the panel. If I may go ahead and quickly uh, answer. Um, my first thought is to, I, I would say, extend as much invitation to the neighboring medical schools, that being Wayne State, and also um, not just the medical school, but also we have, I mean, uh, there's the master social work program, there is, we have a nursing program here. I think there's one thing uh, I would say a lot of people that are outside of healthcare don't seem to understand is that there is a care team, not just a physician and nurses. We have a whole bunch of supplementary staff that help make the wheel turn, so to speak. And I'm sure that all students from those each respective schools can benefit from these kind of conversations because at the end of the day, it may provide them a perspective they didn't know they could have. Um, so that's my first, I, I would say, suggestion. I, I, that's such a great idea. Um, one of the things that I've loved in my career is doing interprofessional education and really working with the different kind of health professional fields to start that team approach to care and to really emphasize the multidisciplinary approach to care. And uh, I was uh, happy to be a, a participant um, at another institution down the road. Uh, and there were some 1500 uh, health students of all the, the ilk that you just described in a room and, and faculty got to moderate these small group conversations, eight to 10, representing different fields. And I will never forget uh, the conversation we were having about a standardized case, a patient, like we would be talking about struggling with a variety of things and homelessness and mental health and cavities and all of it. And the dental student in the, in the group said, I don't understand. I thought that they just came to their appointments. What do you mean you have to worry about transportation? And I knew in that moment, we were having that kind of epiphany. We were having that kind of aha moment where this soon to be dentist was going to be made different about social determinants of health and factors that might uh, help explain why some people uh, brush and floss and do the things that we would want you to do and others struggle with that or why some people take their medicine as prescribed and others choose not to get that prescription filled because they prioritize food or rent over that. And so I think, I think you're exactly right. Those kinds of interprofessional moments that would bring social workers and public health professionals and all of the clinical fields um, 
is a great way to start to instill both the lessons of this book, um, which is the, the, the basis for our conversation today, um, but also really help us make better generation of providers, whatever their field might be. And, and, and perhaps this kind of discussion is an interpersonal or interprofessional group discussion. So I, there's another question I'd like to get to. Um, this is from uh, Dr. Cote. Um, uh, Michigan is starting to require implicit bias education for medical care providers starting in June of 2022. Can someone speak briefly about um, implicit bias and can the panel give their opinions on whether this will have an impact? Um, so the question about you know implicit bias and whether this education will have an impact. Um, of course, some of my colleagues have written extensively on implicit bias in uh, population studies. Any comments on? Well, I think, I think we have lots of data just in the ways that um, Michael Marmot presented in this book about sort of standardized cases, right? Patients uh, who uh, are, are presented, um, you know, radiography, film, you know, mammogram films that are presented to readers and, uh, and when it includes sociodemographic information, uh, race and place and class and different kind of names, uh, naming conventions uh, between names that sound very uh, white uh, like mine and those that do not, um, and the different kind of uh, treatment recommendations and uh, follow up care. Uh, um, we see it in, in persons who present to rent an apartment or get a job and the ways that resumes are read or apartment applications are read and. And, we, and it isn't just standardized cases, but we actually have data um, from systems like VA systems where um, physicians are paid the same, whether they do a particular test or a treatment or a procedure. And so we can even standardize the setting where all of the patients have healthcare access because they're veterans or veteran dependents and all of the healthcare providers are government employees as well. And we still see systematic differences on the basis of race. We still see systematic differences in the basis of sort of where you live in class uh, name. So uh, I think imp implicit bias training and, uh, and really getting in front of the ways that, that our brains are wired to take shortcuts, uh, uh, to simplify. And sometimes that simplification moves to stereotyping, moves to generalizations, and moves to flat out getting things wrong. And so anything that we can do uh, to check those biases that are wired within us, um, I think would, would be a good thing. So I'm, I'm excited to hear that that's gonna be a requirement. I think the requirements, I think it's just an hour of training. And so I hope that it stimulate some interest in the people that do it and helps them recognize that more training is likely needed. I hope professional organization, I hope that um, the certification organizations for, you know, pediatrics, surgery, whatever the specialty is, I hope they start thinking about uh, requiring that as part of their recertification. I think it takes more than an hour, but I think that's a great start recognizing how important it is for all the reasons you said, Dr. Ren, it does influence healthcare and there's no debate. It's, you know, in the literature, it's clearly um, there are clearly biases and we all have biases. So it's not bad to have biases, they're hardwired, but to recognize them is critically important as healthcare professionals. So we're, we're getting almost down to the bottom of the hour. I wanted to recognize a comment from um, the chat room um, saying that he has been out of medical school in the United States for decades, but emphasizing the importance of social teaching and the social determinants of health and they require one month um, rotation advocacy for Pete's residents. Um, and um, maybe we should require that for our oncology fellows, or at least attending the, the health equity book club. And, and then he put in an example of what we should be doing in terms of uh, from New York Times, doctors revolt when the NRA tells them to stay in their lane on, on gun control. Um, you know, I, I mean, doctors can't just be in their lane prescribing the red pill instead of the blue pill. You know, we really have to be out there. And as you know, perhaps as a kind of a, a segue to uh, introducing again our next um, uh, book. Um, now, I've kind of slowly brought in books in my practice. I think I've, I've met, I know I've mentioned this on, di on different um, sessions that at different times, you know, I, I've actually mentioned the book club to my patients who are so excited about this. I've recommended the books and we talk about it a little bit. And 
I think it just sort of equalizes the playing field because a lot of my patients know more about these things than I do. And we both read the same book and come from different aspects. Um, and, and I think, you know, I've had patients that are teaching their grandchildren and I suggest such a big list of books and then the grandchildren read them. And I don't know if um, this person's on the call, but then the, their granddaughter, you know, is the valedictorian at her class. And so, so I think um, it's so exciting in our field that we could bring in all of our interests. It should really, you know, be part of the passion of healthcare. I'm not just saying medicine, the passion of genetic counseling, um, the passion of being a, a patient advocate and a, uh, the, uh, you know, Dean, you know, directing. So, um, so as Danny said earlier, I'm going to let him close this out, but I'm so excited that Dr. Damon Tweedy, um, author of Black Man in a White Coat, is going to be um, our keynote speaker. And we will have a few, we will have a, a student um, and one of our physicians commenting on the book as well and hopefully a robust discussion. This will be our December book club. What great um, holiday uh, gift than to buy your family black man in a white coat. Um, my mother-in-law bought it for me many years ago and I could say, say now that I've read it twice, I will read it a third time. Another good friend says, any really good book you have to read at least twice. So Danny, do you have any closing statements? Oh yes, first, thank you so much to our panelists. This has been one of the most engaging conversation we've had so far with the book club to date. So thank you so much. Uh, it, it, I, I can't think of more words, but it was, it was very well, very well done. <clears throat> I wanted to uh, highlight also for our next book club, we'll also have Dr. Isaac Powell and Taylor Burrow joining us again um, for the uh, book club discussion with Dr. Damon Tweedy for Black Man in a White Coat. I want to highlight again, that's December 16th. Uh, Carmanos Marketing will be pushing that out. Uh, and then also you'll get a link because I have your email from registering for this, for this book club and all our past book club participants will also get an invitation to join us. Um, and I will also be sending out a, a survey to see how this experience was for those who were able to join us today. Uh, and feel free to let us know about other books you would recommend. Uh, we are also going to be publishing our uh, uh, dates for 2022, which is something that we are now thinking about. Uh, <laughs> again, it kind of blows my mind. Uh, and we'll publish those dates for those books. Uh, and then we will announce the books uh, as we go. So uh, any more book suggestions, put it in that survey. I'm gonna send out first thing tomorrow morning. And then we will um, kind of distill the top few choices and then we'll set those out on the calendar for the books for, for 2022. But December 16th, we are having Dr. Damon Tweedy. Uh, our current book club that is wrapping up in a minute went very well. I'm so pleased to have all the folks who, who spent their evenings uh, with us. Uh, thank you to Dr. Simon for moderating this discussion. Um, and then thank you also to Dr. Cote and Laura Zubek who are on our committee to organize this. So too is Dr. Alita Mack um, also on this committee. So uh, thank you so much for everyone to join us. Um, yeah, so keep your eyes open for that email. It'll be coming a little bit later. So thank you all so much and uh, enjoy your evenings. Thank you folks. Thank you everyone. Pleasure being here, pleasure meeting you. Thank you all.